Hey folks, welcome back to the channel. I'm David Bird with Reality Reimagine. I'm an award-winning photographer and Photoshop artist that specializes in fantasy composite art. And we are now finally able to start the lighting tutorials on this channel. It's been much talked about for a long time and there was different projects and things that came along that made it a little difficult to get this footage recorded. But the key factor now is I'm in my new studio space and I'm able to get everything aligned to start providing photography education for you on set, not just with lighting patterns, but talking about all kinds of elements that come into play with photography, and those tutorials will be coming on the channel. Introductions to get us started. This is my wonderful friend, Janelle. You've seen her in some of the previous videos on the channel. If you'd like to see more of her amazing artwork, visit the Instagram account at the link below. So what we're going to do is have three different tutorials, and they'll come out on the channel in regular intervals, talking about three lighting patterns that I most often use. These are my either favorite lighting patterns or ones that are just applicable enough to different genres of photography that it's worth exploring with you. So the first one we're gonna talk about today is butterfly lighting. It's arguably my favorite lighting pattern because it is able to create deep shadows on the jawline, underneath the nose, and so forth. As a matter of fact, its namesake comes from the idea that when you use the light in the right position, it's supposed to create a little shadow underneath the nose that's supposed to resemble a butterfly. In all of my years of photography, I have never seen the butterfly, but I do like the shadows that we see under the jawline, and it can accentuate body parts that can help stand out and create a dramatic look with the light. So we're going to explore that lighting pattern and show you how to set it up at its basic form and then how to augment it by using different instruments and or another strobe and kind of a second lighting pattern in today's video that is very similar to butterfly lighting and we'll show you how all that works. So before we dive into all of that, we'll talk about gear and all that stuff too. I want to start out by saying this, lighting is something that I know a lot of folks when they step into photography, they can be very reluctant to start stepping into off-camera flash. They may start as a natural light photographer and then to make that move into lighting can be difficult because it's not just as easy as turning on the light and then perfectly you have amazing, beautiful images. The reason why this is difficult is because I think too many people don't step into the idea of experimentation. Start testing your lights, moving the lights around, see what resonates with you, see what you like and what you gravitate toward. Experimentation in this art form is key to growth, key to innovation and expanding your brand. I cannot stress that enough. It's important to learn the rules or the basic lighting patterns, but then start augmenting them yourself. Put the lights in different positions, point them away from the subject, point them at a wall and see what happens and start creating something unique. When you do, you're gonna start developing a unique visual style for your brand that will pull people in and then your art can continue to grow from there. So today we're going to be using a Godox AD600 strobe, and then I'm going to be using a 33 inch soft, I'm sorry, a beauty dish from Strobe Pro. And then later we'll be using a second Godox AD600 strobe in the kind of pseudo second lighting pattern that we'll talk about today. There will be links in the description below in this video for all the gear that I'm using today. These are not affiliate links. I do not get any kind of financial compensation for it. They are simply there for you so that you can use the exact same gear that I'm using in the video today. I'm gonna to be shooting with a Canon EOS R with an EF 24 to 70 Mark II millimeter, F 2.8 millimeter lens from Canon. And I'm gonna be setting my camera today to be at F 11, ISO 400 and 1 1 of a second for the shutter speed. F11 is my preferred aperture for most of the work that I do because I get just a deep richness to the shadows and to the light that I really like. It's just a part of my style. F8 is where I used to photograph at for an aperture and that's kind of a general rule of thumb to start photographing an F8 when you do any kind of studio lighting controlled environment work, but then graduate into the F11 as you experiment and learn. So if you wanna step back from me, my friend. Now I have metered my lights to make sure that the lights are powered so that it will provide lighting that is appropriate for F11 ISO 401 one sixtieth of a second. I'm using a Siconic light meter. My Siconic is an L358, which is actually no longer made. I strongly encourage you to get a light meter. 
I know most folks, as you're stepping into photography and studio lighting, off-camera flash, like buying all this gear and so forth can be expensive and daunting. A light meter is essential because if you try to trust your LCD and your camera to show you what you think you're getting out of the light, your LCD lies to you. It's not going to show you the accurate lighting because it has its own luminosity settings in the camera itself. You have to trust a light meter and meter your lights to get there. So if you can't afford a light meter right now, that's okay. Then just try to get it as close as possible. Learn to read your histogram and you'll be able to sense where the lights are but ultimately when you can afford to get to a light meter and they are relatively affordable especially the Sekonic line uh, and I will link one in the description below that's a basic entry-level light meter that can be used for studio work but once you can get there you'll definitely have the lighting that you need to use so knowing the lights are metered and we're all good let's proceed forward let's do a quick test shot just to make sure the camera's fired up and everything looks good Take a tiny step to your left, right there, or your right, excuse me. Okay, here we go. Perfect. Hold there for me. Good. So as you can see the image on the screen right now, we have a good, wonderful shadow underneath her jawline and just a little bit of a shadow underneath her nose. This is butterfly lighting and it's created because the main light or the key light is positioned in front of Janelle, but it is raised above her and tilted down at a 45 degree angle. Now I'm using a Manfrotto stand that I absolutely love in all this type of work because it has a trigger grip. So essentially I close the trigger grip and I can raise and lower the light. I don't have to deal with the different knobs and different stages of a typical light stand. This is a time saver that I absolutely love uh, to use. With this light being tilted above, with this trigger grip, I can lower it down so that if I want those shadows to get a little bit longer or shorter, I can just simply raise and lower the light. But the key is again, tilting the unit itself at that 45 degree angle. That's butterfly lighting at its basic. Now, one of the problems with butterfly lighting is that it can introduce shadows, which is its benefit, its whole purpose, but some of those shadows can come into the scene into eyes. So especially if you're working with a model who has extended eyelashes, this light being tilted above, it's going, or being positioned above and tilted down is gonna to add too much shadow into the pupil and that can cause an issue in the retouch. So this is where something like an eye lighter or a reflector comes into play. Now this is an eye lighter also from Strobe Pro. And essentially an eye lighter is a reflector, but it's in a U shape. And you can get material that's silver or you can get material that's white. Now the silver will throw more light than the white material. The white is much less. And both of them have applicable uses just depending upon your style. Eye lighters became popular uh, a few years ago, mainly because, well, yes, it throws light into the scene, but it became popular because it creates a very unique catch light into the iris of the eyes. It's this half moon little shape. Some folks love that and they were using eye lighters just to be able to get that catch light. I'm not a fan of the catch light. I feel like it detracts too much from the image and pulls focus, usually making the subject look like they're a vampire or a werewolf or something like that, which, hey, if that's your thing, then, right on. Uh, let me know in the comments below and I may look at your well, uh, vampire photos. But anyway, so the eye lighter is gonna throw light back into the scene and that's its whole purpose. You don't necessarily have to use an eye lighter. You can use a standard reflector. You can use a piece of white poster board from an office supply store. Set it on a stool right in front of the subject so that there is a solid surface that is shiny and reflective so light will come down, it will hit the subject, and then it bounces off their bodies. It hits the reflector and comes right back into the scene. But because the light had to travel, there's gonna be a natural fall off of intensity of the light. So it lifts the shadows just a little bit without overpowering them or taking them completely away. So in this case, positioning it right in front of Janelle, the light has not changed. See a massive difference that eye letter makes in that image comparatively to the other one. Now in this case, because I'm using the silver material, it's throwing, in my opinion, a little too much light back into the shadows. And unfortunately, I think it's overpowering those shadows. I did not bring the white diffusion material to set because I suck, sorry. But if the white, <laughs> thank you, my friend, thank you. Janelle forgives me, you can forgive me too. Um, the white material in the eye lighter would not throw as much light. So we'd still have just a little bit more shadow. You can also use a mini stand instead of a typical light stand, a, a low impact light stand. So you can get the light just a or the eye lighter itself just a little bit lower. If the light doesn't have to travel that far, or I'm sorry, travels further in this case, then it's not gonna kill those shadows as much as we're seeing right now. 
So that's the basic augment that I would recommend with butterfly lighting, using one main key light positioned above at that 45 degree angle with an eye lighter, a reflector, a white piece of poster board, anything that throws light and put it back into the scene. Now, let's take the eye lighter out and we're going to introduce a second strobe into the scene. And this is the second lighting pattern that we'll talk about today that is very similar to butterfly lighting and it's called clamshell lighting. Now, I'm not a fan of clamshell lighting because I think it's a really dumb name for the lighting pattern, but nobody called me to consult when they decided to name it long ago, which is just so rude. Anyway, I like seafood, don't get me wrong. I just think it's weird. It's like, I'm going to make beautiful, I know, now I'm hungry. I'm gonna make beautiful artwork with clamshell lighting. It just sounds dumb. Butterfly lighting sounds so majestic. Clamshell just sounds like you're going to Long John Silver's to photograph. Anyway, so this second strobe is using a 12 by 55 inch strip box, again from Strobe Pro, and it is on a mini light stand. It is pointed up at her, tilted up at that 45. So it's essentially two lights that are opposite each other at the 45, hence the term clamshell. The reason why clamshell can be better than butterfly lighting is because you're using an actual strobe for that second source of light so you can control the power of the light itself. As you saw using the eye letter itself, it was just too intense. So if I didn't have a mini stand or that white material and I was doing a photo shoot, I would be stuck throwing too much light into the shadows and I would have to try to come up with something else. By using a second light, you can just control the power and get it where you need to be. So again, this light has been metered and set so that I can get F11 for my key light, and then somewhere between f5.6 and f8 for this one. So it's minimal, it's not going to throw in the same amount of light, and that's essential. You don't want both lights to be powered at the same intensity, because then it's just two very strong, powerful light sources coming in at opposite angles. There will be no shadows, and it will just look like a hot mess. So here we go. Okay, hold right there, perfect. As you can see, the shadows have been Lifted just a little bit comparatively from our first image of butterfly lighting, but not nearly as much as we were seeing with the eye lighter itself. And again, we can consistently keep changing the power of this light so we can lessen that or increase it just depending on what we need. So those are essentially my two like starter lighting patterns. Arguably, I don't use clamshell nearly as much as I use butterfly lighting. I love butterfly lighting because it creates those beautiful shadows that we can see into the scene and it sculpts the subject in a way that just starts creating an element of drama that I really like in my artwork itself. So experiment with the lights, test them, move them around, see how they flow. Let me know in the comments below what you like, which one you prefer, if there's any questions that you may have with all of that. In the next tutorial, we're going to explore Rembrandt lighting, which is my second favorite lighting pattern. It's incredibly dramatic and there's some wonderful images that you can produce with it. And then we'll move on in the series with a third tutorial later on. If you like the content you found in today's video, make sure to give it a like and consider subscribing to the channel because new content debuts each week in photography and Photoshop education. When you subscribe, make sure to hit the bell icon so you'll be notified of that new content when you return to YouTube. And make sure to go to Instagram and visit my wonderful friend Janelle's artwork. She's a brilliant artist, very professional. I love seeing her work. Give her some love on Instagram. Until next time, we'll see you out there in the world of Photoshop.